Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. In today's video, we're gonna have a tour around Glassbrenn's 134 acre regenerative farm, and we're gonna delve into their vision for the farm, and from my point of view, the future of farming. The majority of the content for this video was made up over a number of visits, and including in that is when I visited to do the crowdfunder video, which Abel paid me to create. So I wanted to just put a disclaimer out there, a little bit of what we, you're gonna to see today has come from a video that is promoting Glassbren and also promoting the crowdfunder that they're gonna be doing. So in this video, you're gonna see Abel, the director of Glassbren, Louisa, his partner and co-director, as well as Stefan, another co-director. But without further ado, let's just get started with a video of Glassbren at their new site, Lord's Park Farm. So give me a brief rundown into your plan for the, the, the entire site? Yes, yeah, so what we're looking at is a vision for a highly diversified, community-facing and holistically designed farm and centre for regeneration. So what that means in practice is we'll have a five to 10 acre designed regenerative foodscape. So that will include bio-intensive market gardens, agroforestry, fruit and nut orchards, as well as larger scale veg production for our veg boxes. We'll have about 100 acres of land managed in a holistic plan grazing way for cattle. We will be turning one of the barns into a studio space for teaching, events, community gatherings. We'll be turning another of the historical buildings into a dorm for residential course participants and retreat participants. As well as that, we will be creating a food hub, so an area where our veg boxes will be distributed. We might have a bakery there in future as well as other chances for people to pick up local foods and foods produced here on the farm. So there's three main areas to the vision really, I suppose, is the food centered part, which is where we'll produce food here on the farm, distribute it in our veg community supported agriculture veg box scheme, as well as offering other opportunities for different kinds of produce we can produce here and produce produced in this local area. There'll also be the people focused area of work, which is where we have people coming for retreats and workshops, courses, mini taster sessions in everything from permaculture design to foraging, coastal marine biology, nature connection, woodland management, all kinds of things like that. And then also there'll be the sort of overarching plan for the landscape, which is to um, steward this land for nature and accelerate succession towards more complex, more thriving, and more regenerative ecosystems. So what we're, um, yeah, what we're starting to see here is the early markings of uh, food growing spaces, communal spaces, community orchard. Um, and these two fields we're looking at here are kind of where the focus of like design landscapes are gonna be. So um, these will be sort of abundant design permaculture food landscapes. Um, you can kind of see in the distance in the light today, you can see where we marked out the contour line. So I was thinking we might be cool to go and have a look at that. Um, yeah, let's go. So what did you feel when you first saw this farm? Hmm. Oh, I was blown away when I first saw this farm. I just thought, you know, it came at a time when we were thinking about how do we expand Glass Brain, how do we expand the impact of our work and grow more food and involve more people. And so when I heard about the farm, then I came to visit the first time just on my own. I was like, this is just, I've never seen a more perfect community facing farm, you know, uh, kind of a farm that's just really perfectly set up for involving people from the community and from further afield. The fact that it's on the Wales Coast Path, we're walking the Wales Coast Path right now, comes right through the farm. So there's foot traffic to interact with our farm shop and our food growing spaces. It's only six miles away from our last site, from my family farm, from the land I grew up. So I used to come to San Stefan as a child, to the beach, to the castle. I mean, it's just ticks so many of the boxes of what a farm that, that works for the community, that works for regeneration, works for ecosystem restoration. And the land as well is so full of character, like discovering where the barn owls nest and you know where wild plants grow, like this wild garlic that's just coming up. It's got so much life here as well. That's another key thing is there's so much life that's moved in. There's so much habitat, so much wildlife living here. And there's so much already here that, that makes what we want to create here so much more possible and supports the vision we have for the place. So I think, yeah, the first time I saw it, I sort of strongly believed that this is the place where Glassbrain could grow into a long-term secure future and really build on the work that we've been doing the last five, six years and kind of realize its potential and the potential of the community that's gathered around it as well. 
for us. We're at the very beginning of the process we started seven years ago with our old site, which was starting with a bare field and turning that into a diverse, productive growing space with deep, healthy, lively soil and a real mix of plants, trees, bushes, and lots of different types of gro food growing systems and composting systems. And we're at the very early stages of putting that into place. So I think we've, we've pretty much chosen our sites and that's a big part of the first step is, is we've observed the place enough to kind of know basically where the polytunnels are going to go, where the main growing sites are going to go. And that's kind of been quite easy with the site because it's kind of dictated to us by the topography, by the aspect. So the south facing areas, you know, where the sun is. And so we don't have to agonize too long about where these things go. So where I'm sitting now is where the polytunnel is going to go for our covered crop production. And you'll notice that it's quite far away from the main homestead and the main farm. And that's for a few reasons. It's, it's quite an obvious site, really. It's very sheltered. So living right on the edge of the coast, that's a big factor when you think about polytunnels because they are very vulnerable to wind. South facing, so plenty of sun. There's mains water here. So we've got a backup water system in case our rainwater catchment fails us in a drier spell. And then it's also proximal, really close to the road coming into the farm. So when we're taking produce off to go up to the packing shed to go into veg boxes, that'll be really convenient just to throw it on the back of a quad bike. Yeah, it's got lots of plus points. Possible minus points are, actually, I'm not gonna talk about those because I'm, I'm not gonna advertise how easy it's gonna be for people to, <laughs> to come into these tunnels, but, um, what we lose in, in proximity to the house, we gain in it being the ideal site to put polytunnels. So, and then the outdoor growing sites, which are also behind me, but way over nearer to the sheds. Downhill conveniently of rainwater catchment off the roofs, really nice and close to the packing shed and volunteer shelter, nice and close to the Wales Coast Path, so people walking through can see and interact with the growing space and a nice gentle gradient so we can implement some of those on contour key line kind of food growing systems that we utilize so well over at Bronheil Farm. So we're just coming over to one of the top highest pastures here at Lord's Park, just as we're coming up to the cliff edge. So Lord's Park is a piece of land that sits right on a rocky outcrop, right above the, what they call the Three Rivers Estuary. So we're just coming over the brow of the hill and there's that epic dramatic view. We can see the Gower in the distance and then we can see the end of Pendine Beach coming out here, this, this sandy spit. And this is actually a permissible footpath, so people can actually come through that gate over there, make their way through to the farm buildings. And up here, this is just one of the pastures that's going to be managed using holistic planned grazing, or mob grazing as people might know it. So that's the way of sort of emulating the way ruminant animals behave in the wild, in mobs, in herds, moving them as a herd and a mob through different sections, moving them every day, every two days as a, a way to accelerate pasture regeneration, to accelerate succession and soil building using a small herd of cattle. That'd be part of the, the pasture management plan. This might also end up being an occasional campsite for course participants um, with that dramatic view. It's pretty exciting. This is one of my favorite parts of the farm that I've seen so far, having not yet explored every single corner, but um, it's pretty windy up here, pretty exposed, but it's a pretty special part of the farm. So Claire's brand has over the years sort of grown, grown to me. Well, before maybe let's just say like three or four years back, it would have been sort of the project that my, my partner did and the project I really also believed in, but was also sometimes a little bit intimidated by because ideally I want to just grow vegetables just for us and just be a homesteader. But it grew onto me over the years and actually I feel I realized what it truly is which is just a place for community and for people to come together for a purpose, for people to feel some sense of belonging for something bigger than maybe themselves or our day-to-day -day life. So I think that's what Glass Brand now is for me, is, is this special place that I think we all are, are somewhere craving. Yeah, so where I think like where I see the whole project going is it's going to be a place where every generation knows they can go to, where they have the chance to meet somebody else, a fellow human being, 
in a way that we don't get to meet them in our daily life. Like if you go like into work or if we even go to a supermarket or something, we usually have a very specific task that we want to follow and, and we don't really stop. But here people go with knowing that they are going to slow down because interacting with the environment or with all the things we are going to offer is always going to have an element of slow down, which we have observed brings people together in a very special way. So I think that's what I'm seeing this place becoming, is a place where children, like elderly people, and then those in between can come to connect to the environment, but also to, to a fellow human, just in that slightly different way that we maybe can't access in the day-to-day -day life. So we'll start with a nice, easy question. What is the area of the site and the plan going ahead that you're most excited about getting started with? That's a not, not the easy one. Not, <laughs> not, not definitely not. But what really excites me the most is the kids project. Learning everything about land stewardship, but also stewardship of your own body. So we're just sort of taking that word, but trying to apply it to every element of being a human being on this planet. So it's important to take care of, of the planet and learn what it means to really, truly honor that responsibility that we are given with being born in the first place, but also for the own body, for the soul, for who am I, but also for the other beings, humans or animals. So we're trying to really connect these three different branches, make them almost into a circle of not isolating them from one another and just saying one is more important than the other, because they just all are. Practically speaking, that means they will be given maybe an acre or two. There they will learn to design that land and through playful practices, learn to listen to the land and honor the land, observe the land, but also then go within. So we are really linking them. It's quite complex or maybe sounds complicated, but I've worked with children for like almost 10 years now. and. Um, I think children are actually almost much easier to work with than adults, mostly in these, in these, um, yeah, in these areas. So I'm very excited. What is it that you most enjoy about working with children? They are not yet spoiled by life or conditioned too much. So you see something quite raw just seeing that potential, just seeing that vessel that just wants to be filled and obviously needs to be filled, but having that, that responsibility of giving them the food for them growing up that is really rich and really good for them. So that's, I guess, the challenge that I see in working with children that I find quite enriching. But then if I go now to raising my own son, I think the, the answer would be like just seeing him adopt a lot of things by passively being around. That's what I love. Like if you're around children and you're actually just authentically yourself and that coincides with doing maybe things that they find interesting and fascinating, they can easily pick up. And the other day, a friend of his was injured by a nettle and he's three now and he saw that in the garden and he went to a dock leaf and he took it in his mouth and he insisted it has to be properly chewed before it's going to be applied on the nettle sting. And these things, they are like, my God, that's my romantic idea of vision that I always had um, my child or children just sort of passively picking up on, on these things that so many of us, yeah, that knowledge that we have maybe lost a little bit along the way. Um, yeah, sponges, um, I love that. They're sponges. <laughs> yes. So where, where are the fields going to be and, and what are your plans? Right now we're thinking behind these trees there's quite a nice field. It would be fenced off from everything. And that's why I find it's, it's easier to safeguard. And it's just near to the house. I'm somebody, I like it very cozy and nearby. And I tend to actually be more on the place and tend to the plants more. So that's the location. But yeah, we wanted to make a buffer of potentially trees that we could coppice for firewood. But then the main area of this would be nice for the little stewards because it's nice and fenced off. And in the summer, it's totally overgrown, so people can't really look in from the outside. But my vision right now 
which is just my vision and I don't want to like obviously push the kids too much because it's going to be their design in the end. But my vision right now would be more like a um, sort of natural food forest, maybe with a little pathways going up and down, maybe woodchip path and then a few little islands with some shelters, some self-built, maybe some a little bit bigger, like a proper construction, um, maybe a roundwood shelter. Um, where the kids, where we have a different few parts where they can be, maybe a tree house in the future when we have a few more trees, or maybe one on here. I don't know, it's just, yeah, I, have, I, have, I can see it, I can fully see it. Um, but the age group that we mainly would be working with would be maybe five to, to 12 years or something. Um, and then we offer, but we want to offer things for mothers and toddlers as well. So I'm very excited, I'm really excited for that. Not just for myself, but also for Rua, for our son, that he's going to have a place to go to that. Yeah, he can have friends because he's going to be homeschooled um, and that's all within reach. So that's, yeah, massive opportunity and privilege to be able to steward that little piece of land. Little piece amongst the massive land as well. <laughs> yeah. For me, it started five years ago when Abel asked me to join onto the team and I realised the power that a farm or community like this has to help people with their mental health because it connects you with people, it connects you with nature and it also connects you with the food, the medicine that's around us. So like eating wild food, just being available for the people that come. Right, this is sorrel, this is delicious, got a nice lemony flavour. Cooking is my biggest passion and um, cooking for the community has been just wonderful. Like. The days when we have a group of volunteers and we collect the veg in the morning, cook it on the stove and sit around chatting in the sunshine, sometimes in the rain, sharing the food that we've grown as a community. And um, I look forward to doing that again in San Stefan. It's just up there. I haven't been in this field yet. Have you not? <laughs> no, I haven't been in this field the yet. <laughs> It's amazing really to think that we went from such a small acreage piece of land to now this and I'm still discovering places on it. I'm in awe really, I'm just absolutely in awe of how much we put a lot of effort into Glassburn over the last five years. It's amazing to know that we can, we can have a real impact on people's lives, on our lives, like we can grow more food, we can have more experiences where people can connect with nature and while we learn how to do those things on a bigger scale having people learn with us. You know what, my biggest dream and the thing I'm looking forward to the most is having that banquet, bringing people here and having that banquet in the fields or in the barns if it's too rainy. Maybe go on a foraging journey on the coast, bring some stuff back, collectively cook a meal and then have a banquet. And then people being able to share that beautiful, nutrient dense food. And then oh, that, that community around the table. That's what I'm looking forward to most. And then being able to look at this view at the same time. <laughs> Imagine a banquet on this in this field. So this is this amazing promontory kind of flat spot, one of the highest spots of the farm. It's got this really sort of special magic to it. It's like the gravity point of the farm. It's like this powerful, like in a in a storm, it's like it's like wild and lashing up here but on a day like today it's it's just perfect and still an area of this at least will be kind of a ceremonial spot a spot where where we gather for those moments in the season through the year where we want to mark you know a summer solstice or a, um, a harvest time or a winter solstice because that's a big part of creating this people facing farm is getting back to some of these seasonal rituals and ways that people would have once come together at key transition points in the year I think it all comes down to relationship, really. I suppose the foundation of what, we, what we're trying to do here is to bring people back into relationship with, with the natural world, but, but, but on a more local level, the land that, that feeds them. Yeah, and we have to re-remember really the ways of doing these things. It's not something that a lot of us grew up with, but through some of the songs, some of the stories, some of the rituals that we still know about, we can kind of reach back and, and, and grab those frayed threads of what once was, but we can also bring in our own new things and, and, and create something that's relevant to our lives now and, 
and feels right and feels true um, and authentic and to really weave that into the fabric of what we're doing here so obviously we're going to be producing food and we're going to be farming and we're going to be doing courses and workshops but there is that element that we started over our other place we really want to bring here in a big way is that ceremonial aspect and kind of food being that access point into a relationship with the seasons and a relationship with the land and what it provides for us to kind of be in gratitude for a moment and to give something back to be in kind of something like a reciprocal relationship with the land that feeds us that's that's a really key part of what Glassbrenn is about it must be a key part of any any project that's trying to embody those ethics and principles of permaculture it's another pathway another open door that we can go through into a true real relationship with nature with the land and our part in it I think it's important to have one spot on the farm where it's about gathering the community in that unique more contemplative way that's kind of sacred and it's kind of preserved for that purpose and I think this spot the first time I saw it I was actually with Jason I mean I feel like that's something's got to be built there hasn't it <laughs> and that was the first thing that called out to me was like this is the spot this is the spot for that do you feel any kind of weight and, and responsibility for mm. not just the land but that's Brenner as well and and also then the community and the legacy of a site yeah. like Lords Park responsibility for stewarding land is always is always a weight of responsibility because I do think we have such a responsibility as human beings to play our part in kind of stewarding land towards deeper regeneration and deeper complexity in its ecosystems and being a positive restorative impact with the time that we spend here. But I also feel, yeah, I do feel a weight of, or just a responsibility towards the history of the place. It's woven into the fabric of San Stefan and this local area. And, you know, there's historical references way back to the 12th century of this place just like the castle and other features in the landscape, it's, it's a key part of the history and story of this place. So I do feel a responsibility to that. And yeah, just, it's big, you know, it's a big, it's a, it's, it's a big place. And it's, it's big there's a in lot. so many ways, isn't it? Yeah. Is there anything that there's excited kind of nervousness to tackling that specific challenge? Trying to answer that question, knowing that it will be on a video. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm really honest, it's, it's just, it's, it's the nervousness of, of being enough. So when you're out about like this, out walking the farm and maybe thinking about the possibilities, what, what is on your mind? What are you thinking and, mm. and what are you seeing? So I guess there's two things like trying to be in that sort of, slow observer mindset so we're trying to take the time um you know i always say on permaculture courses and stuff you know we need to take that time to observe and interact with the landscape um understand where the water flows understand where the wildlife's moving um, understand the different characteristics the aspect where the sun shines where the shadowy spots um, and really we should be doing that through the whole year because you know obviously the the arc of the sun is different throughout the year seasons you know change things that's kind of what I'm doing, trying to do at this point, early stages of us being here is really just observing, really getting to know the land, really starting to root and bed in the, in the land and feel a part of it. But also what I'm doing, I can't help doing because it's, it's kind of the way my mind works and the way I get excited about any piece of land that I go to, but particularly this one is, is it starts to come a lot, you know, the vision for it, the, the design starts to come, starts to come to life around me. It's almost like in three dimensions, it starts to, you know, the color starts to fill in, the trees start to come up where I can imagine them in, in windbreaks and orchards and in forest gardens and parts of the land filled with vegetables in my mind. And I can see people weaving in amongst the pathways and people laughing, people exchanging ideas, people, you know, meeting each other for the first time. I can't really help it. It's, it's kind of something that happens when I'm walking around. I just, it's like, it's almost like a symphony of music. It's like it starts to come to life, how the whole farm system, you know, treating it as a, as a whole system where all the involved parts are kind of working together how those are all going to work together where the connection points are if you can listen to the land if you can listen and observe and understand its shapes and understand what it wants to be the vision the, the design kind of comes to life in of itself because the water is telling you where it wants to flow and you know where the springs are and where the sun shines where the sun hits the land observing what plants grow where and why and 
these things, you know, they start to dictate how the design is going to be, which is a really lovely part of the design process is understanding the, the indicators, the signs in the land that, that sort of guide our hands as, as designers and as folks trying to come up with a vision for the farm. So yeah, I can't really even describe how exciting it is as a, as a whole farm designer, as someone who's interested in truly sustainable regenerative farms that work for um, nature, work for people and also build community build culture. Whilst I'm really excited to see what the farm's going to become, this part is also really exciting of being in that blank canvas time and, and walking around with, a, with an imaginary, imaginary mindset, being in the imagination, being in the possibility of what if, what, what could this farm be? Yeah, and that's what we're really asking our community to gather around, I suppose, and everybody watching this video, we're asking everybody to gather around the possibility of what this could be what we could model here, what we could do for people here, how this could support so many people's lives in different ways. And I'm really driven and really excited by the possibility of what farms like this can be for community scale climate action, for building community around a shared purpose, producing food, eating well, being healthy. And so really at this early stage, we want to start to gather that community around this farm and, and give people the opportunity to become involved, to become part of this to, to become a supporter of the farm and supporter of this vision and, and you know if it's something that really connects with folks then then we really invite them to yeah become part of this and come and volunteer be practically involved come and learn things through courses and workshops join in our seasonal events or for folks further afield there's going to be amazing opportunities for you to get involved too so yeah um, this place is really going to be set up to um, support people being involved in it and we're really excited about the community that's going to gather here So for you, what does the farm look and, and feel like in, say, 10 years from now? I actually have something written on my wall above my desk to help me in moments when I feel overwhelmed um, that says, uh, yeah, it just says you have 10 years. You have 10 years. So it's a reminder that there's enough time because that's really, I think, how long it's going to take to see this, this sort of 3D vision that comes to life around me in my imagination really come to fruition you know it's going to take 10 years to see this landscape behind me full of food producing systems abundance fruits and nuts and there'll be ponds and there'll be veg growing areas and it'll be full of people helping to harvest food helping to plant food learning connecting to nature deepening their relationship with nature you know the word regeneration which is a word that gets greenwashed a lot and is used a lot now but to me that that word means bringing new and more vigorous life to a place right so I suppose that's what the next 10 years is going to be about is about bringing more and more and more life to this place and that means wildlife and that means life in the soil and it means life in the hedgerows uh, creating habitat for, for non-human life but it also means feeling lots of human life here so I guess in 10 years I, I hope that there's a sizable community gathered around this farm and that it's a really important part of the fabric of this place the fabric of people's imaginations the fabric of of kind of an interconnected network and movement of farms like this that are sort of trying to model and create what we need to see for a, for a secure, resilient, regenerative and sustainable future. Yeah, because I think, you know, there's, there's an exciting possibility of what community facing regenerative farms like this based on agroecology and food sovereignty can be at that meeting point where all the converging crises of our times come together. And so in 10 years, I'd really like to feel like this farm is embodying the true meaning of regeneration, which is to bring new and more vigorous life to a place. Currently, I give advice to other social enterprises in Pembrokeshire, and Glass Brands is a really great example of a social enterprise. It has a social impact, it has a source of revenue, and the profits are reinvested back into the organisation, into the land, into the community. And not just that, Things like this new place for Glassbren, we can connect the other social enterprises together. So like, my dream is that social enterprises all over Wales and the UK connect up with each other, support each other, so that people are paid properly, so that 
the communities can get involved with organisations that the money is not going to shareholders anywhere. The money is getting used back into the community, back into the employees, back into the volunteers. And then it means that there's more for sustainability out there because we know that big companies don't really care and work properly, whereas social enterprises can really, really help people and become sustainable. Sit up straight, please, Danny. <laughs> what is this? Sit up straight. That's creepy. <laughs> so I think what's what motivates us to be here and to want to have you know applied to become custodians and stewards of this place is I mean it's a dream of ours really to um to live on a place for a long term and to find a piece of land where we can yeah really take responsibility for it and really do what we know we can and apply our skills and knowledge and yeah try to be the best possible partner to the land over a long period of time yes my love yeah thanks that's really nice but i guess this this guy is also this little one here it's him and and all all the children his age you know like just coming into this world just thinking about their future and you know we all know what's going on in the world with climate change and various kind of crises that are coming together at the same time and it's a scary world and it's hard as a parent to think about that future that you're bringing your child into and for us it's really important to get up every day and feel like our purpose is in service to him and, and his, gener his generation. Yeah, I think the motivation for him and for, for children his age, his generation, is that at least on this 134 acres, there's a place where, you know, nature is living to its fullest abundance, where wildlife is able to live a good life, where there's abundant food, there's a secure, resilient source of food for them, um, but also a place where they can learn the kinds of skills we believe they really need for the future, you know? Um, kind of nature skills, practical skills, emotional skills um <laughs> yeah Rua, yeah Rua agrees and why do you believe that it's going to work i have the strongest conviction that we're living in a time right now where this is exactly what is needed and that's not just in terms of climate change or ecological collapse it's as well about the cost of living mental health crises, the crisis of loneliness and isolation, like all these things, uh, that's, that's the beautiful potential of this place is it, it can sit at, at the convergence of a lot of those crises and offer something for all of us to kind of, to heal and build something positive and feel like we're, we're doing something good in a world that has so much that is not good and so much that's challenging and, and hard. It's quite windy. To carry on? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't believe that five years ago when Glassbrenner was just a small little sapling, it's now turning into its teenage tree size and it's growing on its own accord with all the community and, and the volunteers being the water and the earth and the sun for that Glassbrenner, that sapling. And now it's becoming its own entity and it's going to carry on providing for people and um, working with people and yeah, amazing, amazing. So that's a good, good question, how it feels to be part of, of such a project. It's hugely overwhelming and intimidating, as well as such a privilege. And yeah, it does bring me sometimes to sort of like tear, teary moments, because it's a massive privilege to be able to, to try to create this place but overall, we want, we, I do want to have that responsibility and I, I do believe in the vision so much that it just has to work. <laughs> of all the different plans that you have in place and the possibilities of this site, is there something that you can't wait to get started? Deepening into it, getting to know it, spending time in every little corner, every little niche and edge and discovering you know what grows where where the birds nest understanding the land and letting letting ourselves become a part of it 
you know, it's so important to me as a permaculture designer and as someone who wants to steward land for long term, for people, for the planet and for future generations is that we understand the land first and come to understand its unique character and the way the wind blows, the way the sun shines, where the non-human beings are moving through it. And that's how I think we all need to approach land. It's humbling ourselves and taking the time that's needed to understand it before we come and impose our plans and impose our ideas and impose what we think is the best thing to do. At this early stage, I think that's what I'm most excited about. And then the, the project and the ideas and the things will rise up around it. We've been given this incredible, unique opportunity to, to steward a piece of land forward into the future. And that's just... And it's a magical, you know, it's a magical piece of land. It's, it's so unique and it's felt really right all the way along. It's felt like this is, it's felt like we're the right people for this. We're the ones to steward this forward and um, yeah, I'm ready to get started.